Hello, my name is Eric Seaton, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. We are in the Books of the Bible series, which we are now in the fifth year of, and we've been walking through every book of the Bible, one at a time, every summer for the past four slash five years now. Larry is here to talk us through the book of Galatians. I'm not sure that's entirely appropriate. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your good and gracious gifts. We thank you for your hand that feeds us and cares for us. We thank you for your heart that you love us. We thank you for your sacrifice that you humbled yourself even unto death on the cross so that we might have the right to be called the sons of the living God. Lord, we so desperately want our lives to be pleasing to you and to be in tune with what you plan for us. And we pray for your help with that. We pray, Lord, as we discuss the book of Galatians, that you give us wisdom and insight, that we hear your voice. Lord, I pray that you give me your words and your thoughts. And should I misspeak or say something that's not of you, I pray that you would plug the ears of those who are listening and cause them to forget so they only hear what's coming from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We are going through the books of the Bible, and it is my lot to teach on the book of Galatians. So we're going to uh, talk, first of all, about uh, some very, very important things. Who wrote the book? To whom was it written? When was it written? How was it written? How is it structured? And then we're going to spend most of the time talking about what is the main message. As you know, there's a lot in all of these books, the Galatians has a lot of stuff, and there's just not time to cover everything that Paul covers, so I'm going to try to focus on what I believe was his core message. Now, uh, the book of Galatians was written by Paul. Uh, we don't have an exact record of when it was written, but based on the context and references in his book, we, uh, there are many who believe that it was written from Ephesus, uh, on his way, just before he went to Jerusalem, where he got arrested. And, uh, be, and if you read Acts 15, you will see some reference to that events, and it would appear, that, and this happened, we believe, somewhere around 53 to 57 A.D. Now, the next question is, who are the Galatians? Well, the book of Galatians has a unique position amongst the Pauline epistles, and most of the epistles, uh, because other than Revelation and Hebrews, which aren't Pauline epistles, I don't believe, um, all of the other epistles are written to either an individual or a specific church. But not so Galatians. Galatians is not a city. When I say specific church, the way they looked at things back then is if you were in Philippi, then it was the church at Philippi, so it was a city. But Galatians was a state, a province of Rome, and uh, you can see it's this one that's highlighted in the middle. It's got uh, a coast on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the interesting thing is uh, I looked through a lot of maps, and there are two versions of the map. See this little province up to the right in the corner where the name is cut off? You can't see everything. Uh, there are some maps that show that's not there, and that is Galatia. Not Galatia, Galatia. Not Galatia, Galatia, right? Now, 
uh, we believe that uh, if you see that red line, it is, uh, it is Paul's first part of his first missionary journey. And so it is generally believed that he is writing to those churches that he visited on that first journey. Certainly Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that properly. And maybe Antioch, right? Now, here is an outline of the book. It starts out with salutation, and he talks about why he's writing the letter. Paul spends an entire chapter defending his apostleship. Now, there's a reason for this. He is contradicting some people who came in from the outside and are giving what a lot of people back then believed was the Jewish party line, that you need to obey the Torah, the Mosaic Law, in order to have relationship with God. And Paul, through revelation of the Holy Spirit and through the works of Christ, says that is no longer the case. And in fact, if you read the Old Testament, uh, you'll see that even though there was all that law, and there was statements that in order, in order to be you know, justified, you need to do these things. There are many clues that God put in the Old Testament that said he had a bigger picture in mind. So Paul goes to great lengths to defend his authority and his right to say what many people believe was contrary to Scripture. Now, it wasn't, but there were people who said it was, and so he felt he needed to give support so they would listen to him. The next two sections, justification by faith and stand fast in the liberty of the gospel. These are the core of what Paul is trying to get across. And finally, Paul gives his hey y'all at the end, which is the way he normally wraps up epistles. Now, why was it written? Well, as we said, outsiders had come to teach that the Galatians must be circumcised perform ritual washings and food restrictions and follow Mosaic law, the Torah, in order to be saved, in order to be justified, in order to have a relationship with the Lord. Now, Paul makes some very strong statements in this book, and he touches on some theological issues that there has been legitimate debate over the centuries or millennia of the church as to the right way to interpret them. So I want to warn you, it's my advisory notice, that in order to stay in keeping with Paul's tone, I also am using some strong images, and we're going to be talking about some of those things, but I don't want you to misunderstand. I am not coming down on one side or the other of these doctrinal positions. I'm not trying to convince you to be one or the other. I'm not going to explain what I think, but rather I'm going to do what I believe Paul was trying to do, which is focused on the core of the message. So while we're going to reference some of these things, don't misinterpret that for me taking sides because I'm not. The village church is the church which fellowships over shared value in relationship with the Lord. Unlike many churches, we do not fellowship over particular theological positions. Not that we don't have theological positions that are important to us. Once again, don't misunderstand me. But we try to keep those to the core of the gospel, to the things that all of Christians within the pale of orthodoxy have agreed to over the years. So, Brace yourself. What is the main message? Living outside the law. Now, you can see I got a little wanded poster here from the Old West. Actually, I think that's Pecos Bill, right? And so uh, I said that to give you some kind of a meme to remember that Galatians is about not living under the law, but living outside the law. And we're going to talk about that. 
See, it happens that for 1,300 years, devout Jewish people had been taught that right relationship with God was achieved by two things. Obedience to the detailed law given by Moses, holy days, food, circumcision, Ten Commandments, civil law, an eye for an eye. What happens if somebody steals your sheep? And the Sabbath. And then uh, also blood sacrifice of animals for remission of sins as prescribed by the law of Moses. And the subtext here and what Jews had believed mostly for 1,300 years is that righteousness comes from the law. Now it happens that there are things in the Old Testament that look like that, and, but God is doing this for a reason. So, uh, and we're going to come back to that. So it happens that most Christians today, in my opinion, the Bible doesn't talk about these things, but I'm, so just make sure we're clear here. Uh, they believe one of three things. Number one, pray a prayer of salvation and believe Jesus died for your sins and you go to heaven. Once saved, always saved. Doesn't matter what happens after that. Uh, the theological term is persistence of the saints. Now, for all of you Calvinists out there, let me be clear. This is not the actual Calvinist position. It is much more complex and nuanced than this. But this is the popularization which has been adopted by, from my observation, a whole ton, a vast number of Christians. The second one, and I've known people like this, it is less common, but I have known many people like this, especially in certain kinds of churches, is that even after you're in relationship with the Lord and after you are saved, if you sin, you break any law, you are in danger of hell if you die until you pick one take communion or some other sacrament or repent or rededicate yourself to Christ. And I believe most Christians believe what I'm calling the hybrid view, which is believe in Jesus and keep the Old Testament and New Testament law or God will be unhappy with you, consequences not specified. Now, I happen to believe that most Christians believe this, right? And you see Keanu Reeves here going, wait, what? While most of us say we believe in justification by faith, in our hearts, we really believe in this hybrid salvation. And Paul is addressing this. What Paul says is the law does not justify Galatians 2 says, So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. So Paul is saying that is not going to get you there. But he says more than that. He goes beyond, it just doesn't work. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. And he says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ, and you have fallen away from grace. Now, those are some pretty strong words. I would like to interject here. I'm going to read you a little bit of Psalm 19 to give us some balance. Starting in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Now, is the Bible contradicting itself here? Actually, I would say no. 
And the reason is because we, as human beings made in the image of God, use language both to think and to communicate with one another. And God, through the word of God, is using language. And language is far more nuanced and ambiguous than that. We frequently have one word that means different things depending upon the context. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way God made us. I believe God invented language. So I guess he thinks that was a good idea. But in this case, we see the word law in two different contexts. Paul is using the word law in the context of Here is a set of fixed rules which define righteousness. You follow them and you are righteous, and you don't follow them and you are not righteous. And Paul says that is an abomination to the gospel. I told you there's going to be some strong speech here. Right? Paul doesn't just say, that's a bad idea. I I recommend you avoid that. He says, you do that and you're interfering with the grace of Christ and your relationship with the Lord. But Psalm 19 is talking about the Word of God, His decrees, not as rules to follow, but as showing His heart and helping us understand through various examples what His heart is and what He wants our heart to be. Now, I got Rod sitting over there, so I'm going to pick on him. Uh, One of the things I love about Rod's teaching is that he teaches with stories. Rod is a storyteller. And why does he do that? Well, it turns out that God does that. So as much as I admire Rod, he's not the one who thought of that. Right? We learn through stories. Little children learn through stories. Ever seen a little kid play? You know, they're playing with trucks. and Do they know how to drive? No, but they can push that little car and they're driving. They start top down with stories and narratives. And over their life, they fill in the details with experience and knowledge. This is the way God teaches us. And this is what God is doing. So I just want to point out that don't get confused by the word law. It's really easy to confuse all these concepts if you try to switch around and confuse these two meanings. Now, doing the law doesn't get you anywhere. 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, then I may boast, but do not have love, I am nothing. I gain nothing. What you do does not make you who God wants you to be. Jesus said it differently. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and your name teach people to obey the law and in your name perform many miracles? I threw that last part in just so you know. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I almost quoted, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Because that's how I originally learned it. So you see, doing these things is not the way to be righteous. You see, the law is for children. Galatians 3, 23, 25. Before the coming of the faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So, the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. See, children need rules because they don't have the capacity to understand the why. So we have rules for them like don't play in the traffic. Don't go out 
into the street when there's cars. Now, if I got up here and told you, that's what God says, don't go out in the street when there's cars, then you couldn't walk to the store. But my two-year-old, I'm not going to send walking across traffic to go to the store. But I can go. What's the difference? Well, the difference is they don't understand the danger and they don't have the experience to judge the speed of the cars and the complexity of the rules of the road. So they just can't go out there. Likewise, don't talk to strangers. Actually, I have to confess to you that this is one rule I refuse to have for my children. Now, this is me personally, and you might tell me I was a bad dad. And I'm sure there are some ways in which that is correct. I'm not sure about this one. But here's why. I felt to the, the danger to their worldview and how they felt about people by saying all strangers were dangerous, don't talk to them, was worse than the potential danger of them being abducted. Not that it, that danger was zero. And of course, we did things to try to protect them. We didn't just drop our kids off at the park and come back uh, at the end of the day, although my parents did that with me. <coughs> but then that was back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? But you see, this is a rule to protect someone. A kid does not have the ability to know when someone's lying to them and dangerous. Right? Share your toys. Well, sharing is good. Generosity is good. But if I took my monthly paycheck, which I need to feed my family, pay the bills, meet my obligations, and just gave it to some stranger on the street, I would be remiss. This is not a good thing. It's good to be generous, but you have to do so with context and wisdom and under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So you see, the law is not to be used as these are the rules that God wants you to follow. Because quite frankly, he couldn't write all those down. Now, instead of saying to our kid, don't go out and play in the traffic, I could have created and made them memorize a 15-point list of only do this, look for this kind of car, only cross in the red, you know. But they didn't have a chance of understanding it. So I just said, you know, let's just keep this simple. Don't go play in the traffic. Well, see, humanity and the nation of Israel were children. They didn't have the maturity or the experience as a people to understand what God really had in mind. So he created these set of rules. But keep in mind that these rules are neither necessary nor sufficient Those are for all you math geeks, right? And computer geeks. In other words, they're not necessary to have a relationship with the Lord and be justified. And if you do them, they don't make you. They're not sufficient either. Let's move on. How then do we live? Well, Jesus did teach do's and don'ts. He taught in stories. Turn the other cheek, seek first the kingdom, don't lust, don't hate, feed the poor, visit the prisoners, all good things. Does that mean if I go visit a prisoner, then that justifies me with God? No. If I'm in a position where I can't go visit prisoners, does that mean I'm locked out of the kingdom? No, neither necessary nor sufficient. Paul also teaches the same things with more detail, giving pastoral advice in how to live out Jesus' teachings in a church community in a specific cultural context. Now that is a whole different sermon. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into it. There's, I could give you lots of examples. But the point is, he was not making law, in my opinion, 
Remember the uh, hybrid view? Go obey the Old Testament, the New Testament law? Well, it is my personal opinion that there's no such thing as New Testament law. It violates the whole purpose, the heart of Paul and his revelation. In fact, there are stories and instructions and guidelines to help you understand if you're living out the life that God wants you to live. And they are instruct, they can instruct us. There are laws that are good rules. Don't murder. I think generally that's a pretty good idea. Uh, don't commit adultery. Gen- absolutely. You know, don't covet. Absolutely. But you see, we don't, do, we don't avoid these things because that's the rule. We avoid them because, and we're going to get to that in a minute, because then we're living in the flesh and not in the spirit. Do we live our lives in the flesh or the spirit? See, the issue is that Paul brings out in Galatians is that the Old Testament laws about outward behavior are fulfilled and superseded by life in Christ. That, too, is a long sermon, which I don't have time for. We are no longer children living by the rules, but we are adults living life by understanding and relationship with the Spirit who lives in us. So so Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Now here's the why. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How do I know if I'm living by the flesh? Well, Paul anticipated the question and gave us the answer. But the acts, many, tr- many translations call that works, of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Most of these things are really describing your heart condition. Now, some of them talk about what you do if your heart condition is particularly messed up, but the core here is who is in control of you? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? Now, he flips that over and says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now let me clarify here. Neither one of these passages, the works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit, these are not law. They are not rules to follow. I always take my sermons and I run them by my wife, who, those of you who know my wife, knows that she's both smarter and more educated than me. Right? And she pointed out that the English word rule is based on the word for ruler. It is a guideline. It is a measuring stick. It is something you use to help assess your motivations So if you find yourself subject to fits of rage, it's not that being angry is evil. It's that you got got a heart problem. And you need to go before the Lord. Now, and the same thing, if I say, okay, obey this rule, be peaceful, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it does, but it doesn't, right? But you see, these are the measurements. This is the fruit. 
This is a way for us to look at ourselves and say, am I in the spirit? Am I in the flesh? Here is your homework for the week. I want you to take these two passages from Galatians 5 and read them every morning. This is not going to take you very long. I don't think this is a huge ask. And say, look at yourself and say, as I go into the day, which, which of these describes how I am better? Use this as a guideline that I think if you do that, Paul would be happy. Now, it turns out that we have the Holy Spirit in us, but as Mark taught us last week from 2 Corinthians, we have these treasures and jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power that is in us, the power of the Holy Spirit is from God and not from us. In 2 Timothy, uh, Paul says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted in you. Now, when you talk about treasures in earth and vessels, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. Mark, last week, wonderfully pointed out that a earthen vessel, a jar of clay, is something that can be easily cracked, and when it's cracked, the light of the treasure can be, show through. It happens that that's my wife's favorite way of looking at this. But also, you can look at it like this. Earthen vessels, jars of clay, were the first century equivalent to styrofoam cups. They were cheap, hard to clean, and disposable. Now, I don't know about you, but as I get older, I am increasingly aware that this jar of clay is common, hard to clean, and eventually disposable. You can see that, right? All you young people, just wait. That's really condescending, isn't it? Hey, anyway, forget I said that. But here's the point. The point is, is that we have the Holy Spirit in us, and the jar of clay is our flesh. Which one are you going to listen to? Which one rules your life? Which one embodies how you are? The book of James, in James, James says, you show me your faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. Is he turning back on Paul and saying, okay, never mind, it's what you do, it's not who you are? No, he's not saying that. He's saying the same thing I'm saying, which is th this is how you can tell if you are living a life in the Spirit. Now, we've bandied around this term. It's another theological term, and I'm going to disappoint you because I'm not going to do a deep dive into that. <clears throat> also, lots of material there that we don't have time to cover. But I'm going to say this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to or acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. If you really trust in the Lord, he will put his spirit in you to live like he wants you to live. That makes you his righteousness, not righteous from your own strength. That's all I have to say about that. But this is the essence. It's all about relationship. It's all about God's work in us. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about the flesh. And that's what God, that's what Paul, excuse me, is saying. If you try to order your life by following these rules, that is living in the flesh. And 1 Corinthians 13, Jesus, that will not get you anywhere. You have to be transformed, regenerated. And the only way you can, now it is helpful to use all these rules and all of these teachings to monitor yourself 
and to help guide yourself toward the spirit and away from the flesh. Now, as we dive into these things, there's a lot of what ifs that's going to come to people's minds, and so I'm just going to bring them right out. What about, right? Well, if people don't follow the law, won't they be unrestrained? Can I please God if I don't follow the commandments? Isn't there a conflict between law and grace? How, how do I know which commandments to obey? Isn't this teaching cheap grace? Let me say this about that. I mean, I want to check. Uh, this, these questions show an orientation toward justification by the works of the law. Every one of them. Yes, it's true that living in the Spirit is a higher calling. It's more difficult. There's ambiguities. Requires wisdom. It's less certain. It's not cut and dried. But this is God's way. And if you disagree, I think you should talk to the Lord about that. So, we're going to wrap it up here. We started with a wanted poster. Now we have another one. I really like this poster. And you can't read any of that. I know that. Uh, this was out back in the days when I was a hippie, which was a long time ago. And yes, I was. This was my time. I'm not necessarily proud of it. It just was what it was. I mean, there were good things and bad things. But this says things like, Jesus was a notorious leader of an underground liberation movement. His appearance was a typical hippie type, long hair, beard, and sandals. Nowadays, that doesn't mean much to you, but back then, it was at the, at the center of the culture wars. Right? Charges, practicing metal, medicine, food distribution, healing the sa- on the Sabbath, and winemaking without a license. <laughs> Raising the dead. He associates with known criminals, radicals, prostitutes, street people, and even claims that he is the only way to heaven. Beware, this man is extremely dangerous. Warning, he is still at large. So, how are we going to live outside the law? Jesus was executed for disobeying not the Roman secular law, but the law of Moses. Now, it turns out he was innocent because he understood it better than him, better than they did. But he was living from the Pharisee's standpoint outside the law. And 1 John chapter 2 says, The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Some of you are old enough to remember the old What Would Jesus Do movement. We had bracelets, WWJD. I taught a Sunday school class. We talked a lot about what would Jesus do. Well, it was kind of a catch, kitschy, you know, but the thing was is it had some really good core. The truth of the matter is, you want to know how to live? It's a great question to say, what would Jesus do? He is our leader, and he said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Here is our standard, living outside the law. And finally, I thought this poster kind of looked more like the first one. It's similar. But this is where we're at. We're living outside the law. Now, living outside the law is not being an outlaw. It is not one who spurns the law. It's not one who thumbs their nose at the decrees of God. They're someone who are no longer under those, but called to a higher calling, which is life in the Spirit. Now, let's have a few questions or comments. Feel free to call me out if I've stepped over a line somewhere. Anybody have any thoughts on any of this? So just like the rules that we give our kids, um, they reveal what we care about. 
the law revealed what God cares about. And even though um, the law and the rules were more in broader strokes, um, even though they had a lot of details, um, it would have been too hard to um, really explain his love because there was no concept for it. And um, I think that even the apostles that walked with Jesus had a hard time understanding the concept of that. And we today have a hard time understanding that concept. But I think that with the help of the Holy Spirit, um, it's a little easier, maybe. That is good, Tricia. But um, I think that it's good to know the rules and the laws, to know God's character better. <coughs> That's good. And I would like to point out, for example, the laws that uh, Paul was all on about, circumcision, food laws, etc., God's heart in giving this to his people was to set, a si set aside a people for himself. And he deliberately gave them outward signs that everybody else around them went, oh, dude, what's wrong with those folks? They're God's people. And when, uh, when God extended the cross to the Gentiles, which he did in Peter's vision on the roof, Remember, Peter was on the roof, and all of a sudden, this vision came down, the sheet full of unclean animals. These were animals that were clearly forbidden to be eaten by the Mosaic law. And yet, God rescinded that because he said, that period is gone. So when we talk about what God wants for us, we have to understand the reason for those laws. And I think that's what you were saying. That was good. Marcus. Hey, this is, oh, hello. Uh, I just was to say the the it seems clear to me even in the Old Testament that there's there's the outward signs of the law, um, but the the longing of God even in giving him his, his law is to impact the heart. Amen. Which is clear in the prophets yes. when they when they say again and again there's this call to like you know you're doing all these sacrifices and I don't care about the sacrifices I don't care about the uh, you stop it stop doing all this stuff. It's the heart. Are you taking care of the poor among you? Are you taking care of the foreigner? Are you taking care of the widow and the fatherless? This is good. Um, so there's, even in, in the Old Testament, when we look at that, we say, oh, well, it's all these laws and the sacrifice and all these things. Even there, it's still about what's happening in the heart. Is the heart after God? Is the heart about the people and, and care? Um, which is what they're missing, which is what the Pharisees are missing anyway in the New Testament is there, it's all about the external appearance and not about the heart. That's so good, Mark. Thank you. I've been uh, fascinating watching my oldest two children um, learn that they desire the toy that the other kid is holding. Um, so, but but something something happens that I think is has kept coming to mind as you're talking through this. So they, you know, they both have an A or B argument. Is it is it Lucy's or is it Luke's? And and I'm standing to the side, and um, they both <laughs> they look to me for a judgment <laughs> in in, uh, in their own ways, and. Lucy's getting really creative about the way that <laughs> she draws it to my attention. So, but, but I'm standing here and I care immensely about the situation and what's going on. But to me, I'm like, whoa, it's not A or B. It's, you know, I, I, I care about how you, how you're treating each other. What the, what goes back to real relationship. So I, I appreciate it. Cause you know, I'm wondering which times am I getting hung up on? Is it A or B? And I go back and forth and I think, well, okay, okay, actually maybe it's B. Oh, but there's these arguments for A and really God 
is thinking, you know, it's not that he doesn't care. He cares immensely, but he, but it's not an A or B question. <coughs> That's so good. I really liked you shared Second Corinthians one fourteen. Um, so I was looking it up to write it down. The verse that said, "With the help of the Holy Spirit within us, carefully guard <coughs> what has been entrusted to you." And, but it ac- up there it actually said First Timothy one fourteen, and I want to read what First Timothy one fourteen says because it just really relates. Um, Paul says, "How kind and gracious the Lord was! He filled me completely with faith and the love of Christ Jesus." And before that, he's saying, um, "How thankful I am to Christ Jesus our Lord for considering me trustworthy." and appointing me to serve him. Even though I used to scoff at the name of Christ, I hunted down his people, harming them in every way I could. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. And then it's verse 14. How kind and gracious the Lord was. He filled me completely with the faith and love of Christ Jesus. And I found that just because the reference was wrong, but (laughs) it was like, (coughs) to me, I was struck by, okay, guard this life of Jesus that has been Mm. entrusted to you. And then here's Paul saying, like, it was all God's action in me. Like, here I am in ignorance and unbelief. And then how kind, what a kind God we have that he then fills Paul and fills us completely with his faith and love. And it's to me that just like, here you're talking about grace and law, and it's like the action of God, like... I just hear the invitation of us saying, like, fill me completely with mm. your faith and love, Jesus. That is good. That was, that was really a great, w- great way of using that. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, that was really a neat talk. Uh, really encouraging, challenging, and enlightening. Thanks. But um, I also wanted to share a different angle, maybe, or a nuance, or similar to what Tretia said, or, you know, the, the laws for kids. And in some places, you hear the idea that it was a tutor, a teacher. Mm, mm, oh, that is good. And, and so I, um, I've always thought of that as until I see how far I am falling short of what God wants, I don't see the need for a Savior. Mm-hmm. But when I see the law and I go, whoa, how do I compare to that? It's more likely that I will see the need to repent and actually begin that relationship. Amen. And emphasize that is a good Bible, brother. Anybody else? The law strikes me as useful um, as an objective, easy to understand, very, that is what you're supposed to do. You're not doing that. You're messing up. And I wonder how, without the law, in love, we can approach sin in other believers and in other um, people that aren't necessarily believers because I don't know, like, they don't have the same experience of whatever it is, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but, like, I don't know how to get them to just see what I'm seeing, and without the law, there's a lot of, like, it just, like, this is what I feel Christ is telling me, and, like, it's it's kind of ambiguous and yes so i have a couple things to say about that first of all great great observation you know and secondly uh that's why i read that scripture in psalm 19 because the law teaches us the heart of god but i think we have to be careful in applying that as rules in other believers' life, you know? Uh, Clearly, if we see uh, a married person who is in adultery, well, that's against the Ten Commandments, but that's not why it's wrong. It's wrong because it is an affront and a betrayal of your vows with your spouse of their uh, heart and faith in you and of your relationship with the Lord. 
So I think we need to be comfortable with that ambiguity as well. And I think we need to be careful when speaking into other people's lives that we are speaking to the heart issue. So yes, I think that we can break out the scripture and say, the scripture says this, but I would rather break out Galatians 5 and talk about works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I'm not saying that it's never appropriate to go back and talk about a specific part of the law, commandment, and say you're violating that. But I think we have to be extremely careful, and I also think that we need to live with the ambiguity because part of the reason that the Pharisees were the Pharisees is that they decided their interpretation of the law was right, and anyone who violated that, they used that as a weapon against them. Where Jesus hung out with prostitutes, clearly disobeying the law, I think, <laughs> and tax collectors and sinners. Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, don't look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, look at the plank in your own eye. So I, certainly there are times when we need to speak into the life of someone who is on a destructive path. But I think we need to be careful when we do that. I don't think it should be our normal modus operandi. So, uh, sorry, but that's what I think. Anybody else? Okay. I'm going to end in prayer. Heavenly Father, as Peter just pointed out, these teachings can be difficult and hard to apply. And we are imp impaired by our own lack of understanding and judgment. And sometimes by our own desire for justice. But Lord, you are so gracious with us. I pray that you help us live in the spirit and not in the flesh. Lord, we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, and yet not us, but you live in us. I pray that we would live that out. I pray that Everything that I said does not accord with your word would be easy, quickly forgotten and ignored because it is your word in us that has power and redemption and transformation. And we pray that that would flow into our minds and hearts and flow out through us in our thoughts and actions throughout the day, throughout the leaf, this week and throughout our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.